Welcome everyone. I'm Kathy Butcher from National Groundwater Association, and I want to extend our warmest welcome to you, not only for coming to the Groundwater Expo, but also to hear the debut of the 2007 McElhaney Lecture. Uh, before we begin, I have the great pleasure of introducing Mark Reeder, who is the Director of Field Marketing for Frank Electric Company, and our gracious uh, benefactor for the Educational Research Foundation, to sponsor the McElhaney Lecture Series. Well, thank you, Kathy. Um, as you know, Franklin Electric is a company that is a manufacturer. We make things. But, you know, at the end of the day, the fact of the matter is, is that our products are only as good as the installations. And those installations are only as good as the people that put them in. Such like it amounts to, at the end of the day, if there's a failure, the homeowner, the homeowner or the farmer could really care less if it's a product failure or if it's an installation failure. So Franklin Electric is committed to, to making the installations every bit as good as the products that go in them. And that's why we're so committed to this series and really why we are so committed to this uh, to training in general, to make those installations as good as other products. So it's, uh, it's, it's on, on behalf of Franklin Electric, it really is our pleasure to, to sponsor the uh, McElhaney Lecture Series. And uh, before we get on with Ed, what I'd like to do is present a plaque to our outgoing lecturer, Fred McInish. And thank him for, 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 for his service over the last year. Thank you very much. Thank you. I must say that's a very beautiful flag, and I was uh, actually greatly honored and privileged to uh, do this series, and uh, I actually learned a lot. The gentleman that's coming behind me uh, Mr. Ed Schofield uh, is a man of great knowledge and great, and of great expertise. He's a very hands-on person. He, can, he not only can talk about what he does, but he can literally, physically go do with what he does. <coughs> the gentleman uh, has over 25 years of field experience in water well and oil and gas drilling and well completion designs in the southwest U.S. and Alaska. He is a graduate of Cal Poly, San Luis Obsipo? Obispo. Obispo, thank you. Ed began working in the oil field as a summer hire with Getty Oil even before his graduation. In 1979, upon graduation, he recru was recruited by B.J. Hughes, an oil field service company, as a regional sales engineer. In 1988, he joined Johnson Screens as district sales and marketing manager for the Southwest. His presentation today is water and oil. They should really, they really should mix, and uh, I really believe this. Man has been drilling water wells for thousands of years. The oil field, the oil field drilling industry spawned in Titusville, Pennsylvania, in 1859, has depended upon the history and technology of the water well industry for the majority of its technical innovations in drilling and completion practices used today. Technological, uh, technological advancements such as rotor drilling, top head drives, drilling fluid additives, metallurgy, sand control techniques, and well stimulation were all first attempted in the water well industry. Today, numerous drilling and completion advances from the oil field are now being transplanted back into the water well industry. This presentation will employ an historical overview as to the springboard as to where today's water well industry can adopt and benefit from various new techniques and practices and refined by the oil and gas industry. And with that, I'm going to step aside and uh, give it to Mr. Schofield, and uh, you'll learn a lot. I know you will. Thank you. Mr. Schofield, thank you.
Thank you very much, Fred. I had the honor um, about a month or so ago of uh, meeting Fred for the very first time. He was speaking for the California Groundwater Association. And I mentioned to my wife I was going to go and meet Fred. And she goes, well, how are you going to know who he is if you've never met him before? And I said, trust me, he's the Don Ho of the drilling industry. In those shirts, you can't miss him. So anyway, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, some of the topics I want to touch on today are basically stemming from my 20 years of working in the water well industry where I've walked into a customer's office and sat down and they've bemoaned the fact that they've had a problem they can't seem to get a resolution to. Uh, I'll go off and say, well, yeah, you can do this. You can set a bridge plug, you set some cement, you can go back and, and reverse circulate and stuff. And they stop me and they said, where the hell did you learn that? I said, well, it's done every day of the, world, of the week in the oil field. But we're not going to do that here in this industry. And what I'd like to do is get us looking over the fence. What we need to do as an industry is bring our prices up. We need to be more profitable. We need to be able to do a better job. We need to be able to differentiate ourselves from those folks that are, in fact, low price, low price leaders. This industry is getting more and more demanding. Water quality issues are becoming more and more demanding. And if we don't differentiate ourselves and don't come up to speed, we will probably be lost. So with that, I'd like to get started. What we're going to basically talk about is, a, a, again, a brief history of uh, the water well industry and the oil and gas industry, how those two came together and how they played. I'm going to mute down my class. Excuse me. I was hoping for a lapel mic because I don't stand well for very long. And then how as an industry we can learn from the oil fields advances and the techniques and learn from their experiences and basically at the end of the day still make a buck. My hope at this point in time is to go ahead and generate some interest in some of the things that are being done in the oil and gas industry, things that are not beyond our reach, things that are not beyond our scope, and seeing what we can do in this challenging environment to bring things up to speed. The water oil industry today is dynamic and demanding. We have water quality issues. We have water uh, sourcing. There's greater and greater demand for groundwater. And what we need to do is take a look at the dynamics of the industry and see what there is in regards to uh, addressing some of that. So the delivery of a new well is literally the birth of that well. And delivering that well to a client or to a customer is just a single first step in regards to maintaining that well and making sure it's a long-term benefiting uh, entity for that customer. I argue that we try to keep in front of that customer as much as possible, whether it means preventive maintenance or just checking in from time to time. It will differentiate you from that other contractor, from that low-cost low contractor, and trying to make sure that these wells are about to be a ripe old age. Um, some issues that uh, are affronting us in California are that permits for new wells are extremely difficult to come upon. So what we're now uh, required to do is come up with situations where we can, in fact, work on longevity. And more and more studies are being done that the investment up front in regards to the best materials possible give us that longer term life because we aren't going to get the permits to go back to work on that well or to drill a new well. So we're having to make the investments up front. And last but not least, you can't ignore a production well for very long. I can't tell you how many folks have put wells in operation and basically stated that's it. It is, in fact, done. Well, these things are now living, breathing entities. With the bacteria that are native within the formations and such, we know for a fact that periodic maintenance and we know the periodic cleaning is going to be re required. And if you don't, you're going to find your pocketbook will bring it to your attention. So a little bit on the well drilling history. I think most of us are fairly familiar that well drilling is an honorable profession going back well before biblical times. I mean, the, uh, the Persians, the Iranians today, were, were well known for, for drilling horizontal wells or shafts into the sides of mountains. Uh, Joseph and his, uh, and his brothers made use of an abandoned well several thousand years ago, as referenced in the Old Testament. And the Chinese were building bamboo cable tool rigs as far back as 4,000 years ago. So in the mid-1800s is really where some of the developments came upon. And I might reference you to go back to the National Groundwater Association's uh, website. They've got some great pictures of some of the very earliest rigs, horse-drawn and then eventually steam-driven applications. Some of the later advancements in the early 1900s were the development of the drilling fluids of the muds that were used to kill and just control some of these wells that we're now finding that were pressurized. And the simple fact that the tricone bit and even steel cables allowed us to drill deeper and find ourselves in circumstances where we can, in fact, enhance and get even uh, better production. In recent years, drill rig design, drill bits, drill rig or uh, drill string enhancement, improved casing, and the polymers that are now being introduced into the drilling fluids and have been for quite some time are all elevations of uh, basically the advances that we can utilize. And again, I want to emphasize that a drilling professional is really going to take advantage of these situations so that we do, in fact, find ourselves in a situation where we can get the best return on our investment and manage the assets as best as possible. 
Now, the oil and gas industry had a very interesting start. The very first oil and gas wells were basically oil seeps. That was production that was witnessed on the surface. It goes back to the Chumash Indians in the Southern California area that utilized the, uh, the tar for lining some of their clay pots. Uh, in the 1850s, a leading chemist was actually hired to see what he could do about some of the oil seeps that were evident in Pennsylvania. And they were trying to see whether or not the actual seeps were in fact sufficient as aluminum. So, Drilling was uh, evident in Russia, uh, some in the uh, uh, Czech Republic, but primarily our industry got started here in Pennsylvania. And what it turned out was that they were drilling wells in a region that they had obviously known oil seeps, and they weren't really sure what to do with it. So lab tests determined that the oil could in fact be distilled, and there were in fact numerous applications for it. So what you had in 1861 was the Tarfield Well. It was a, uh, a zone that had been drilled for many years for water well, for old salt wells as they refer to them, and the Colonel Edwin Drake, he wasn't a colonel, they just tried to go and utilize marketing back in the 1800s as best as possible. Mr. Drake was in fact uh, nothing other than a promoter and tried to get as many investors together as possible. And no different from, I think, from the days from the standpoint of promotion, the colonel title gave him some more respectability. But he read about the news and read about the wells and the prospects and so he said, what the heck, let's go ahead and get together. And I think it was his third round of investors that finally got him where he in fact, in fact discovered the oil that he was looking for. So they encountered numerous setbacks, but on the 27th in 1859, Drake and his crew was down at 69 and a half feet. The next morning when the driller had in fact uh, shown up at the job site, I'm sure with a cup of coffee in hand, as most of us are to have to do, noticed that he did in fact have a fair amount of oil sitting on the top of that, uh, that well. So by today's standards, it was unremarkable. I think it was 20 barrels or so of uh, production a day. But for the next 40 years, Pennsylvania was, in fact, the world leader in oil and gas production. So it is interesting from that feeble start that quite a bit has come full circle. Triumph Hill in Pennsylvania in 1871. In this particular picture alone, I understand there's over 100 derricks. These were all wooden derricks. They were all permanent derricks. And um, this was one of those uh, 100,000 barrel of, a year producers who made some of the purest oil at the time in the country. And again, this made Pennsylvania the uh, leading oil center of the world until the Texas boom of 1901. Black gold erupted from a well near Beaumont, Texas, in a height of nearly 150 feet on January 10th. The Christmas tree was developed in regards to trying to control this flow. And um, drilling fluid was also introduced on one of the following wells as an attempt to try to go ahead and uh, control these, these uh, high, pressure, high, res uh, high pressure reservoirs that they were encountering. 850,000 barrels of oil was lost, and by today's standard, it was about $500 million at $60 a barrel. Some of these wells were such prolific producers, they even rivaled what we have in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East today. And the funny thing is, is that they had to hire everyone in town to try to build sand barricades to just to simply cool out the soil. Now, the environmental factors that would have been employed in that regard would have been, uh, well, I think, uh, scary by today's standards from the standpoint of the amount of pollution that probably is exhibited. But $500 million from a couple of simple blowouts was a pretty sizable investment. The other thing that made it rather interesting is because of the huge amount of oil that was initially developed out of these few wells, that the market cratered. And the oil field is known for ups and downs. Uh, there's numerous bumper stickers that says, please, dear Lord, let me just have one more, uh, one more boom before my day. So this was the first. Now, numerous wells were being completed up and down the coast of California before this time into the 20s and the 30s. In 1875, the very first offshore attempt was made out of Ventura, California, in which a derrick was actually built out into the uh, coastal waters, and wells were drilled, cable tool wells were drilled out in the, uh, the surf line. So some of the first offshore completions were really not true offshores, but they were in fact derricks. This particular picture here is very close to our home in Southern California. The, this area right here was referred to as Signal Hill. The Spaniards, this is probably about uh, six or seven miles from the coastline, and the Spaniards used that as a signaling device to bring ships in during high tide so they could load off the, uh, the tallow and some of the uh, skins that were being generated from the haciendas that were in operation in Southern California at that time. Um, in the mid-1850s, some beautiful homes were generated there. But one sorry day, somebody drilled a well, and that huge, it happened to be a huge geological anomaly that was packed full of oil. Some of the largest production wells on record at that time generated out of the Signal Hill production. So 
the houses went and every bit of history went with it. And this was, in fact, a huge rush, putting anything even equivalent to that of the gold rush uh, of the 49ers in California. And you can see that this amount of wells did a great deal for production, but regretfully they recognized too late that they were decreasing the production reservoir pressures and what they basically did was kill these wells. There's still probably as much as 50 or 60 percent of the proving reserves of this heavy oil that are still latent within these formations. The simple fact is, is that because they destroy the reservoir pressures, they'll never be able to go and get out without tissuary, which is either water flow or steam, the balance of the oil that they would hope to have gotten. So the API came about as a result of World War I. Uh, the American Petroleum Institute goes back to the efforts of World War I, and at the time, if you recall, there's a book that was written called The Prize. It was a, it's a, a significant amount of reading, but it's extremely interesting in regards to the, the rise of the uh, Standard Oil Company and then its ultimate demise from the standpoint of the uh, antitrust laws. But in 1911, the antitrust laws basically dissolved Standard Oil, and there were three major independents that were formed from that. But with the outset of World War I, the dependence upon oil was becoming paramount. Strategic oil reserves were set up across the country. One of them was in, in the San Joaquin Valley of, of Central California. But there was no experience of these companies working together. There were no standards at that time. So what happened was Congress got together with a commission, I think it was the, um, next slide I think has it, was the U.S. Chamber of Commerce developed a quasi-governmental body. And what basically came from that was the standards that we all call today as the API. So the industry efforts to supply the fuel from World War I were not only highlighted, but it became an obligation and it became their charter. And so in 1919, the American Petroleum Institute was, was established. And I should mention that the National Groundwater didn't come along until another 30 years later. So maybe we'll have to wait for another water war for, uh, for us to get the recognition we're looking for. But from those very early days, patents were established. And from those patents became standards. Standards on threads, standards on compatibilities of, of pumps, drill collars, Everything possibly imaginable was all now under the guise of the API, and that has really helped spearhead this particular industry in regards to moving forward, since they've had the guidelines that are so desperate from the standpoint of assuring compatibility. And from those standards today, the elevation and the advancement of the techniques have basically allowed them to move forward. It doesn't help that we only have $60, $70 a barrel of oil as well. But some of those techniques and standards today are some of the ones that I really hope to go and uh, embellish on from the standpoint of where we have opportunities. This particular operator right here is operating a rig off the coast of the uh, North Sea. He's got two computer terminals and four video terminals. He can witness what's going on in the mud pits. He can witness what's going on in the shakers. He can witness on what's going on um, on the operation on the floor. And he's sitting the lazy boy. Um, this is an advancement in regards to the liners actually being drilled in. The, set, the bit is actually sacrificed, and the entire uh, drill string is drilled in and completed accordingly. And some of the advancements now in which at the uh, outset from the bit back, you now have measurements. So you can now indicate or find exactly where your bit is, orientation of your bit, but you can also do logging. You can also find out what type of formation you're going through, all with a single bit and bottom hole assembly. So some of these advancements today are what I opportunities for us in the, in the future. I want to get this term clarified because, again, there is some confusion in regards to directional drilling. In the water well industry, most operators understand that utility boring, that is an in and out approach to uh, work, is the directional drilling. In the oil and gas industry, the directional, there is no re-entry. The drill rod and the casing are only brought back up to the surface. And so whether or not it is, in fact, from an abandonment mode or from an avoidance mode, or from a uh, whipstock that is attempting to go and move around an existing liner, where you have this directional orientation. And these, again, give them a great deal of latitude from the standpoint of the footprint in which they've been given. If you've only got 80, 80 slots on an uh, oil and gas platform, you've got to maximize. And if you've completed or lost the screen interval in one of these uh, particular cylinders, you can move back cement over and, again, redrill and whipstock off. This, I thought, was rather interesting from the standpoint of just the amount of in, uh, uh, information that a driller has at his fingertips in the operation. Again, I mentioned this lazy boy approach. These guys go through hundreds and hundreds of hours of training. We'll get into some of the simulators and the virtual reality work that's being done. But an operator standing on the rig floor supervising his crew can see his bit, he can see his hook load, he can see the volumes in his pit, 
tell exactly what he's got from the torque, the pump rate, the pump pressure, total stands, and his uh, rate of penetration. All from simply looking at some of these, these uh, advancements in uh, electronics. All of the stuff is all off the shelf today, but these are things that we need to start looking at. The automation in the industry is what's driving the oil and gas industry to making some of these advancements. Some of this automation is certain things of what we need to be looking at today. I mentioned virtual reality. The military has been utilizing the Department of Defense and um, nuclear reactors. A lot of uh, work has been done over the last 15, 20 years in regards to, or I should say, the last 10 years in virtual reality. Well, some of this is now coming into various industries. And I mentioned this from the standpoint, I sat through a presentation last year at a, at a uh, driller's office in which they were basically stating that initial hires were one of the biggest problems they were having. They would hire a guy, he would pass all the scrutiny and tests, he turned right around and he wasn't interested in the, do in the job after a day of, the, of working in the field. This gave them an opportunity of having that man go through the rigors of all the testing and such, making sure he was suitable for the application, but then gave him a day of what it was like on a rig. So you could, in fact, see the operation driving. You could work the heavy equipment. And in this particular case, again, the military first came up, hopefully we're not carrying weapons on job sites, but just in case. Um, but the simple fact is this virtual reality now gives us a lot more latitude and a great deal of, of uh, cost-saving measure from the standpoint of finding that qualified candidate, but also moving that guy forward from the standpoint of this is the kind of work you're going to experience. This is what you'll be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And a follow-up is that later training of all. So once you've got a guy who's working in the derrick, you can come down and start working on the floor. Instead of spending time and having maybe end up missing a finger, he can in fact get all the virtual training he needs before he goes out and accomplishes that. And this is a tremendous saving in the industry, not only time, but also from wear and tear on the other employees as well as from the operation that the, uh, the management has to go through. Now the other thing that really is paramount on the oil field is the rig safety. They take this seriously. I've got some funny slides later that I'll, humor slides I guess I should mention, of some of the activities and stuff that can happen from time to time on a rig. But this is from the top down. More and more from the standpoint of management down through the lowest worker. If you've got a back truck operator who is backed up without a spotter and hits something, not necessarily is that back truck operator gone, but the operator themselves are oftentimes gone. The consequences in the oil and gas industry for safety are paramount today. You can't get on a job site unless you have all of these according and you know, go ahead and stand out from the standpoint of how many days of safety and where you are standing in that regard. You've got to sign in your visitors. Hard hats are mandatory. Eye protection is mandatory. Steel boots, work gloves, full harnesses, random drug tests, and evacuation plans. Great story years ago, I was going offshore on a, on a um, platform, and they had the very first drug test that had ever been done in this particular facility. And my crew was standing off to the side, and we, we completed, I actually scared them to death because I knew it was coming up ahead of time. I said, clean out your pickup trucks. I don't want anything that's going to cause any problem. But the uh, the driller for that particular tower was coming on board and everybody was backed up because they were going through the vehicles. And um, I walked down and, I, and he said, he said, hey, what, Ed, what's going on? What, why the delay? And I said, oh, they're doing a random drug test. He goes, good, I hope they get those druggies. Well, I looked down and he had a quart of malt liquor between his legs. He was just finishing before he was going to go on shift. That's the paradigm of thinking that has to go on these days. Everybody thinks that drugs are, in fact, a, a bane, but that uh, quart of malt liquor probably wasn't helping as well. So the random, random drug tests and stuff are something that really have, in fact, uh, taken full, full effect and have really promoted a great deal of increase in regards to safety in the oil and gas industry. And again, I put this in here from a humorous note, and I don't know why they take safety in the oil field so seriously. There is a great website. It's a Canadian website of humorous anecdotes. I can't remember the exact title of it. I saw it a few months ago, of bloopers in the oil field. This particular situation right here I thought was rather interesting. This is an 8-inch drill. Now, the first one took out the company man's pickup truck. The next one took out the company man's trailer. So I've got a strange feeling there was a great deal of discussion that went on later from the standpoint of how did this happen from the standpoint of the rig was over 150 feet away. But the simple fact is that they've got to take a great deal more care from the pressures and the problems that they've got with those reservoir pressures. But you've got an 8-inch drill collar to land here as well as take out the company man's truck. And then obviously fires and everyday occurrence and difficult challenge that they have to address within the oil and gas industry. Now here's a new one for you. This is something that has recently come down to our company, that is the Weatherford organization, the, the parent company of Johnson Screens, but for every other service company that I understand is in operation today. That is cell phone operation while driving a, uh, a vehicle. 
they have made it rather clear that uh, the studies show that driving while, well, in fact, uh, driving while doing cell phone quadruples the prospects of a collision in the conversation and the equipment and sometimes go ahead and be a menace from the standpoint of dialing. So jurisdictions, I can go state for the state of California now, 2008, you will be mandated to have a um, hands-free device for any cell phone operation. So the state of California is coming up one more notch. What a great boon for the Bluetooth industry. But the simple fact is that around the world, and specifically some of the states now, are prohibiting cell phone usage unless you've got either hands-free or, in this particular case, within the oil field and service companies, they are banning the use of any cell phone operation while operating a motor vehicle. And I put this one in here as well. One of the biggest distractions, and I am the first to tell you I'm guilty of it, is eating while driving and trying to carry on a cell phone conversation. There is a great deal of distraction that can come about from it. But again, these are more of the emphasis and more of the push that are being, that are being promoted from the safety orientation of the oil field. Now, I put this in here from the standpoint that I sat through a presentation a few months ago in the San Joaquin Valley, Bakersfield, California, that talked about some of the new safety handling devices. There is automation going on in the oil and gas industry, as I referenced earlier. There is actually automated rigs now. The rigs are such there are five components that are drawn up together as a modular setup, laid out, bolted together, and two men operate a drilling, a drilling rig. There's a helper and the driller. Both of them sit back behind a uh, bulletproof portion of uh, plastic, and they're able to operate from not only the setup and the, the filling of the tanks, the, the mud pits and such, but the handling of the tubulars. And the thing that I find rather interesting is that all of the studies in the oil field indicate that 80% of all injuries come from handling tubulars. I know that I have gotten banged up in my day from the standpoint of standing around or having something rolled on my foot or my hand, and uh, I don't got it for a minute. But some of the elevations in regards to the power, excuse me, some of the elevations or advancements in regards to the power tongs and stuff are trying to get away from this because, again, they're really moving towards trying to get automated and they're trying to get away from as much uh, reportable injuries as possible. Now, here's what I put in here just for my own, own sake. We have a welder, and he is on his knees welding up some four-inch casing. Why do we do this to our welders? If we could build a 36-inch simple raised cable as an assembly device, we could get this guy off his knees, strengthen up his back, we get a better weld, we probably get better quality control, and I can tell you firsthand you'd get a much happier welder after a 12-hour tower. I mean, no one enjoys doing that kind of work. But the simple fact is, is that so much is done with guys welding on their knees on the rigs that this is something that is not done. I hadn't witnessed it until coming into the water well industry, and I'm, again, trying to go and be a spokesman from the standpoint of uh, making sure we have happier people by the end of the day. So let's get into some of the drilling fluids and drilling completions. We've got a lot to talk about here. Bentonite, we all are very familiar with. Bentonite was, again, first developed some of the cable tools, but specifically on, on some of the oil and gas applications and the weighting, of, the weighting up of the bentonite, the thickening or the viscosities that are required to try to control and kill some of these wells. Polymers are some of the uh, next elevations or advancements in the industry. Polymers have been around a little over 20 years. They have a great deal of advantages from the standpoint of giving us a better, cleaner completion overall, but you need to know they're there. And engineered completion fluids, there's a lot of work that's being done in emulsions, actually specifically tying up water, aqueous, as well as um, hydrocarbons from the standpoint of trying to go and benefit the completions and get some better overall breakouts. But these are the three that primarily we're dealing with in the industry, the bentonites, the polymers, and the engineered completion fluids. Now, bentonite drilling fluid is pretty straightforward. It's a clay, but the type of clay is extremely important. If it's a montmorillonite, which is basically the name of the clay, we've got the specnite group or what's used in the drilling industry. Bentonite swells. We're all very familiar with when we add water. We want to go and try to go and get that um, uh, ideal situation where we can protect the formation from the invasion of any further drilling fluids. And montmorillonite forms a basic rock. and It's formed as a volcanic and marine uh, byproduct from uh, geological time. Now, something that is not very well published in the industry is, in fact, that there are different grades of polymer. You probably know from the simple prospects of what you can afford, but there are montmorillonites that are Wyoming bentonite, and there are montmorillonites that are basically generated out of the southwest. A benefited mud is not something that's been advertised much in the industry. It's, in fact, something we've been witnessing in the laboratory from the standpoint of trying to assure better breakouts, trying to get better overall completions. 
A bed night is basically a Montmorillo night, but it can be extended. That is a polymer, and a small concentration of two to five percent can be added into that uh, material, and basically adding yet again some better rheology, some better uh, formation protection. But if you don't know what's in there, you're going to be hard pressed to get the best development you possibly can. So what we're trying to go and emphasize is that yes, if you are going to buy a lower grade of Montmorillonite of a drilling clay, if it's not a Wyoming or a, uh, a calcium-based uh, drilling fluid, you're going to want to go and take a look at heavily chlorinating these wells after, in fact, the uh, development or during the development, I should so to say. So commercial bet betonites, um, what we're basically looking at is the carbonates and some of the problems with synthetic polymers, the polyacrylamides. And again, you will not see these mentioned on the bags of a lot of the, the drilling fluids you're, you're presently buying today, but you have to know for a fact that they're in there, they're doing you the benefit that you need to have addressed, but the simple fact is you also have to know that you're going to need to spend a little bit more time chlorinating these wells, not for disinfection, but the simple fact that you've got to you now oxidize or break down the polymers that have been added. So, what you're looking at is something around 1,500 parts per million for a 12 to 24 hour period. A lot of operators, if they're typically using like a polymer, which is a pure polymer, will add in a sodium hypochlorite during the gravel packing operation, during the installation of the filter pack, knowing that they're going to break back that polymer. However, I would go and argue the same is true from the prospects that if you're looking at running a polymer added bed night, you still want to run a 1,500 part per million for a 12 to 24 hour period. You will get a, that much better completion. And again, it's not for the disinfection, but it is simply for the prospects of breaking down that polyacrylate. The huge discussion in the industry today in the oil and gas industry is skin. We would call it mud damage. The oil and gas industry refers to it as skin damage. So the thinner the wall, the better that we're going to have an opportunity or the better chance we're going to have for developing that back up. And in the oil and gas industry, they actually don't develop wells at all. So what they want is a skin that disappears. They want one, two, three percent residual against that formation. So the thinner the filter cake, the less the, the cleanup. I mean, the discussions that I usually run is that we're deliberately damaging the formation by putting a filter cake across that, that interval. In the development process, we're now deliberately going back and trying to clean up the mess we initially made. In the oil and gas industry, they do not develop wells out. So they take the effort and they go the extra mile to make sure that their fluids are clean, that they keep their solids as low as possible so that the residual is, in fact, as thin a filter cake as possible. <coughs> Something here, we've got a lot of this that happens in the southwest where we basically are dealing with a tremendous amount of fluids, so we'll just have earthen pits and such. In a lot of the areas, we're actually getting um, secondhand real estate. We're getting places that might have been manufacturing facilities or might have been um, rail yards or something to that effect. If we don't line our pits or don't make some kind of conscientious effort to go and make sure that we're running with some kind of surface tanks, we have the prospects of introducing surface contaminants, that is a petroleum product or something to that effect, into the well as simply part of the byproduct from utilizing earthen pits. So we've had wells that I've witnessed that have been rejected because of the poor water quality generated because of the, the contaminants that were introduced when in fact we utilized a uh, earthen pit that didn't have it lined. I know that in a perfect world, a piece of plastic would work, but oftentimes we're going to take that out the first time we get the back over on the job site. So what they do in the oil and gas industry is they work with everything they can in either an earthen pits that have been lined, oops, excuse me, earthen pits that have been lined, here's an example right here, but they also go to the extra mile from the standpoint of the stick and the shales, I'll get this right, the shales takers, the cone sanders providing better, cleaner filter cakes for skin damage. Thus, again, they clean up a whole lot more effectively. And a big, big emphasis that I can't talk strongly enough about is making sure that we do, in fact, utilize only the best products going in. I'm going to emphasize this time and time again. Making sure that you're utilizing clean, potable water, something that you would probably drink, something that you'd also guarantee that has gone through the pumps and the lines to make sure that everything is sanitized before we introduce any fluid to that well. So we want to use fresh water. We want to take samples of that water. Rinse all the tanks clean and make sure we separate, especially after a cement job or anything from that uh, operation, we want to make sure we separate what we're doing. Again, I'd argue from the standpoint that solids control promote better completions across the board. We want to make sure that we utilize all of the advantages that we have out there, the cone de shakers and, and sand de sanders and such, that give us the benefits of making sure that we don't recycle some of our fines. Start clean and keep the system clean with separation and filtration. 
this is what we're talking about from the standpoint of fine formation sand. This can be the de determining factor from a good well to a great well. The simple fact is, is that if we recycle some of these fines and don't utilize the screening and such, we can basically just put that formation fine right back in and placate whatever possible permeability we had in that formation. We can add that to, again, a thicker filter cake and make almost an impervious uh, skin that will be hard pressed to try to work with. We'll talk here in a few minutes in regards to optimal thicknesses of gravel packs, but the simple fact is if we can eliminate having this sand recycled or re recirculated back down to our well, we're going to spend less time having to clean that well up. And I know that folks at Wygrate, they've got a great well. Well, who knows, or a good well. Who knows what a great well might have been if they've not been able to go ahead and promote perhaps some of the uh, opportunities here from keeping some of those formation points. This is a um, picture we're down in Mexico this last year and uh, stumbled upon this crew just a couple blocks from our hotel. I carry my camera right now with me. My wife just thinks I'm crazy. But anyway, these guys were drilling up, I think, roughly a 90 to 100 meter well. It was going to be a four inch completion, a six inch borehole. And this is exactly what they had for solids control. They've been out there for a couple of days. The site, the recirculation and such was such that I've witnessed this in any other state that I've ever witnessed in a lot of job sites. But this, I thought, was just a great example from the standpoint. That was the extent of their recirculation of uh, materials and such. And I'm really hard pressed to go and argue that they're really going to have much of a wealth from the standpoint of not having any solid control on this particular completion. Sampling everything that gets run into the well. The oil field has got accountants, engineers, and lawyers. Now, the lawyers are the new to us, but the lawyers are, in fact, the evolution of what the industry is coming to from the standpoint of a lot of folks that are willing to go after them. So what they need to do is know that if there's a failure, if there's a problem, if there's a blowout, where does the problem lie? What can we do? And so samples are taken on almost everything that gets run into an oil and gas well. I mean, I'm going to emphasize photographing. Having a digital camera at your beckoning side will will provide you an opportunity of making sure that you know exactly what product will brought up to the job site. Measuring everything you got run into a well site. We recently had a situation where I had a contractor call me up and he started yelling at me because the screens were the, uh, the incorrect length. We were supposed to give them 20 foot overall, well they were 19 feet with an extra, or excuse me, they were 20 foot screen length with an extra um, 12 inches of uh, well ring on both ends. After he finished yelling at me, I said, you know, you're right. I probably gave you too much screen. I apologize for that. I won't charge you, but next time, don't you think you might want to measure some of the stuff before you put it in the well? It got real quiet after that. So, again, the measurements are, I think, are critical from the standpoint. He was stubbed up six foot, at, six foot uh, over and above where he was supposed to be, and he tried to explain that to the uh, the owner. And then making sure that everything gets run in and out of the well. What's oftentimes done in the oil and gas industry is that samples are taken. In this particular case, this was a lead slurry that was utilized. This was a tail slurry. Lead slurries are typically extended with pozzolans and gels. The tail slurries are typically neat cement. So you take a sample of the dry, you take two samples of the, of the wet. I'm a huge proponent of making two samples. One, you let everybody play with. Everybody in the rig wants to play with wet cement. The other one, you go hide. If you continue to play with cement, it will never set up. It will become basically fixotropic and you'll never get it to set properly. Take two samples, go hide one in your trailer. But take the other one, let everybody on the job site play with it. The other consideration that's missing from this picture, however, is the mixed water. If you keep the mixed water, the cement, and a dry sample for 30 days, that well typically is going to be complete and you'll be long on your way. But if there are questions, if there are circumstances that come about, well, you've got something at least to fall back on. And saying, I don't know, or I don't have a sample, is really a poor excuse in court. <coughs> and trust me, the lawyers are following just as closely as the accountants and the engineers are in this industry. So from all of this, one other thing that's going on is a lot more of the Wi-Fi. I've got a slide to follow up on that. A great deal of work in the oil and gas industry means that um, numerous wells are being completed in the field and an engineer may not be able to witness it. He's now able to go ahead and basically sit right next to that operator because the entire project is being Wi-Fi. He can actually sit at his desk at a computer terminal and witness the progress. He can witness the, the cement, the density of the cement, the um, equivalent circulating pressures and such, all from his desk. More and more automation is going on so that this guy has a CD that he'll hand to the customer at the completion of the job, but the engineer can witness that job by simply sitting and, and uh, watching the operation go by from his uh, laptop. So I mentioned this Wi-Fi from the standpoint of if we start looking at remote well site operations, we can observe the status. Instead of a guy having to call up and try to get the driller on the floor, if you've got Wi-Fi going on and it's 
obviously going to be argued by a lot of the hands on the rig that it's you know, Big Brother watching. But if you've got Wi-Fi set up, you can observe exactly what's going on with the well. You now have a second backup from the standpoint of what's going on with your deliveries, your service work, your status, and now you've got a record. Now you've got a DVD that you can hold, and that DVD can help you from the standpoint of establishing your hours, the safety, how did an accident come about, how did it get the forklift stuck in the mud pit again. But I mean, all of these can help from not only the operation, but also from your billing and your invoice. You now have something else to back at the driller's log in the doghouse from the standpoint of what hours and what operations were taken. I really can't emphasize enough collection of samples. So not only when we're, when we're um, service work and, and the makeup water and stuff, but also all of the drill cuttings and all field sample materials that gets pulled, we want to make sure that we take those samples, take them as representatively as possible, and we keep them. You want to keep and hang on to those things for, again, another 30 days. You can dispose of them after that, after your sieve analysis and everything have been complete. But if you've got any questions, it's best to take some samples. Now, the geological uh, well drilling guide that um, Johnson has come up with, Tom Hanna in particular, I refer to this as the Tom Hanna playing card, offers us a great deal of consistency now in the, in the industry. There have been many attempts to try to put things together, but now one card is, in fact, all-encompassing. And what it basically gives us is a standardized format that promotes basically a submittal from the report that's standardized. So you've got everybody working on the same description, descriptions and same um, discussion. Your personal preferences in the fields are eliminated. So that by geophysical logging and these guides here will give you an indication of what exactly it is you're working in, in regards to the formation. But once you've done that, once you've standardized that, you can now bring it back into the office. And instead of having to fill out a well completion report. Instead of having to spend the time doing this, you've now got an Excel spreadsheet. And by doing that, you've now got an opportunity of putting it off in electronic measuring and emailing it to the regulatory uh, groups that you're looking at. So you've got standardization, you're eliminating the personal content, you've got ease in regards to an Excel spreadsheet for promotion of uh, getting the report done faster, and now an electronic filing. So it really does behoove you to try to go and see yourself in a situation where we're trying to get more consistency across the board. I've got a couple of samples of these. Here, would you mind just hand these out? My lovely assistant, my wife. <laughs> yes, yeah, one little sec. I learned everything I know from Fred. Um, so from the geological uh, logging, we can take a look at that. And again, those will go with an Excel spreadsheet. Your state organizations now have access to that. We publish that at, a, at basically our cost and the state associations, whatever cost they garnish to it, that's now going to their um, uh, scholarship funds. So again, these charts that we're talking about will in fact give you an opportunity to go and standardize, but also put a couple of bucks towards the, uh, the scholarship fund. Um, screen slot selection, again, I'd argue, you know, more and more, Al Smith, one of our technical service managers, God bless him, he does sieve analysis four or five hours a day. But the simple fact is, is that gravel selection from any type of gravel completion or filter pack is as much of an art as it is anything else. And a lot of field records will overestimate the grain size, and so getting labs assistance is obviously in your best interest. You want to take sure, you want to take a, a consideration from here, but trying to get something from the laboratory will greatly assist in this endeavor. Um, grain size analysis, getting a commercially available filter pack. You want to select the most representative samples. You want to make sure that they're representative. Again, we talked about making sure that the samples are representative and getting things to the laboratory. Try to make sure the samples are dry and crushed so that we do, in fact, have something representative. Try to make sure that there's no hydrocarbons on it. We've actually had a fire in the lab because we had to go and dry something and it caught on fire. Um, and divide the samples up. Everybody asked me in the field, what do I need? I think a half to one pound, or I use the, the uh, all, almighty one quarter or one uh, coffee cup as a, um, as a mark of what it is that we want to send to the laboratory for sieve analysis. And then the filter pack material itself. There are numerous advances in gravel packs and filter pack material that are going on in the industry. One of the biggest considerations is the longevity. As I talked about what the oil and gas industry is looking at, and I also talked about what the water oil industry has is, is got from the standpoint of not getting permits to go back on. If you utilize something that has a lower silica content than, say, 90 or 95 percent, and you go back in to do periodic acid, acids, or you have a corrosive or, or encrusting water, primarily corrosive water, your gravel pack may very well be dissolving on you. If that's the case, 
as your gravel pack recedes, your formation finds are going to come in. So we emphasize, and again, I get cups of coffee from Colorado Silica, Silica Ogilvy North quite often. What we really emphasize is trying to find as high a quality, excuse me, high a quality of silica as possible. Um, some of this particular material right here is of 90-95% silica. It basically means as once you've done an acid or two or three acid jobs, that product will still remain in the uh, in the well board. And the other emphasis, I had a couple other slides. We do, um, well, we'll do sometimes 20, 50 ton um, gravel packs, and we'll have to go ahead and bring out material in these super sacks. A lot of times, however, the product is brought out, it's, it's not bagged, it's just dumped out on the ground on the job site. And in a lot of these urban areas, we have a lot of cats. We have a lot of wildlife and, and other um, animals. And it oftentimes looks like one big kitty litter pile. So I really emphasize, wherever possible, make sure that the product is brought out in bags, that it can be, in fact, be sampled, and that's critical. Just because it says what it says there, again, the sampling is going to help you from the standpoint of ensuring the, uh, the cleanliness and the quality. And again, sample, sample, sample. I can't emphasize that enough. Optimal thickness of a gravel pack. Everyone is of the opinion that a thicker filter pack is a better way to go. At least that was a conveying information that was probably in the last 10 or 15 years. But we're now finding that the thicker the gravel pack, the more difficult it is to develop. That is much more difficult to bring those fines and that deliberate damage we did when we drilled and completed that well. The optimal thickness of a gravel pack now means that we will, in fact, be able to go ahead and facilitate the energy, the mechanical energy, to bring those fines back through. So if we're looking at five inches, we may be hard pressed to get everything in that we want to. Thick, thicker filter pack is probably going to go ahead and impede that success. But a thin filter pack, and especially in a well where we aren't properly stabilized or centralized, is going to be a problem as well. So I'd argue that if we ever have a chance to go and take a look at our borables in relation to our annuals of gravel, we need to take a look at exactly what we're, what we're contemplating from the standpoint of both getting the best bang for the buck, the filtration, the centralization, but also the prospects of getting that developed back up. Excuse me. Water quality issues. This is a huge issue in the southwest right now. Arsenic is becoming a blue light special. Um, case in point, I mean, a superior well design and completion means little if you can't use the water it's intended for. The contractor I'm working with right now drilled a well to 1,000 feet and got the uh, developer at 3,000 gallons a minute. The developer was ecstatic. Until such time, of course, they did a water quality and they found that they had 48 uh, parts per million of arsenic. Well, they had to go back and, and plug back over 50% of that net interval. They're now back at 800 gallons a minute with about eight uh, parts per million arsenic, well below the, the, the uh, means. But you really got that developer's attention. We got 3,000 gallons a minute. Now, you could put a surface filtration and, and treatment center on the surface, but that's another couple of hundred thousand dollars. So my, my point is, and especially with water quality issues between Paramount today, once you drill down through a zone, take the time to sample those specific zones. And we'll talk about that with some drill stem tests in a second. But identifying water quality issues before you will have to complete will keep everybody from the standpoint of, uh, I think, a little happier. And that zone sampling is really very straightforward. In the laboratory, you can go ahead and get the analysis done overnight. The lab analysis can help you determine the, the uh, requirements of not only placement of the screens, but specific materials. If you're looking at highly corrosive or if you're looking at encrusting, what type of materials? Will low carbon steel be the optimal material, both 304 or 316? By getting some real simple work done from a lanyer, a risner, and a dissolved oxygen, and I think the laboratories are charging $100, $200 for that study, you can make decisions beforehand in regards to what materials that would be optimal for placement in that well. And knowing that, you know, you've got a, a highly corrosive water and you left to put low carbon steel, well, that's a decision you can make, but you may very well be looking at a uh, greatly reduced longevity in that well's life from the simple prospect that 304 might very well have been an investment you hated to make, but it might give you two or three times the longevity in that well's life. So water quality tests, basically what we're promoting is going down through an interval, drilling through, and then coming back up. And uh, Hank Baskey will be happy to talk to you about inflatable packers. Hank was one of the Maclean speakers a couple of years before. But inflatable packers, either that or bentonite straddled with a um, screen interval, you produce that interval for anywhere between 8 to 10 hours and then take another sample of it after a few hours, take that to the laboratory, and they'll give you an indication of whether or not that's a zone you wish to complete. They'll do it in either 20 or 40 foot screen intervals. But that way, as you work your way down, you're getting more and more data in regards to the water quality issues. 
and you're then able to go and figure out what zones you need to placate or which zones you need to go ahead and, and uh, cool back on. Drill stem, I think this has been around for a long, long time. Basically, two inflatable packers. This particular interval here can be uh, adjusted. But what, it, again, it allows you to do is in an open borehole, take a given interval, sample that interval for a period of time so you get an indication of where your water, water quality is coming from. Again, this may not necessarily address all of you today in this audience, but I will, in fact, argue that water quality is becoming a huge issue, and it is not going to become something that we're going to be walking away from anytime soon. So putting the effort up front from the standpoint of completing some of these wells, knowing that we've got stringers of arsenic, knowing that we've got stringers of, of uh, other constituents that we cannot handle within our groundwater that may preclude that water from ever being utilized, uh, well being utilized, some of these particular tools and some of these advances will in fact go a long way. Excuse me. The other uh, indication that I really want to emphasize is production, logging, and sampling collection again. Getting an electric log is just one more opportunity of getting a snapshot of what's going on down hole. They are reasonable from the standpoint of their cost, but they offer you a benefit from the standpoint of what kind of information. I'd argue the word critical is probably uh, commensurate with what you can do from the standpoint of not only an efficient well, but also once again, through the utilization of SP and such now, you can find production intervals that you may not have witnessed while in fact drilling that zone, and it gives you indications again of some of the water quality issues that you can avoid simply running the electric log. I think most of you are fairly familiar with it from the standpoint, you've got a logging truck, the electronic uh, equipment, your reel, and it runs back down through that interval. But with, what, again, greater water quality demands, having the knowledge that you may very well have to put that in. And once again, this may very well be a cost up front, but if you're differentiating yourself to that of your other competitors in the industry, you may very well find yourself coming up with better completions. You may be able to go and tell your customer what zones they need to work through and keeping as much time in front of that customer and letting them know some of the advances that you're aware of will differentiate yourself from that guy who's charging 25% less. Well casing selection, don't believe everything you read. We'll get into that here in a couple of slides. But I want to talk about the, the type of casing and the connections, what type of um, connections you're looking at, the tensile strength, the column, the collapse, and the corrosion resistance. We didn't communicate earlier. Excuse me. Corrosion resistance can be an indication of what we historically know or by going to the laboratory and having them help us out. The column strength is just simply the ability of that material to take the weight of the column or the total string on the, the, uh, the last joint of the bottom of the well. The collapse strength, the simple fact of being able to withstand the forces that are coming in on the casing or the screen during the completion or the development. We may very well find ourselves in a situation where we can very easily cover the collapse strengths required by the standard completion. But the development energies that are generated when we're working on that well, the, that well screen, we tend to go and see greatly enhanced uh, energies coming upon the collapse strength of the screen and also on the tensile portion of that. So in the casing as well as in the screen, you want to keep in mind that you don't necessarily want to believe everything you read, but you also want to take into consideration that you're going to be seeing great, a great deal more force exercised on a lot of the material during the development phase. Clean strength, clean straight, beveled edges, no used material. There's a lot of gas transmission line that's being utilized to stay in age for uh, casing. Just that small amount of um, hydrocarbon that's residual inside some of this user surplus pipe can in fact cause you some of those water quality issues that may come to haunt you. So again, I would definitely recommend that if you're going to look for material, make sure you don't have any used material, or if you are, maybe from a surface conductor or something to that effect. But don't invite the constituents, don't invite those contaminants to come haunt you. And then take a look at, this is not as good a picture as I could, could have hoped for, but this basically gives us an indication that it's an ASTM A53, and it's a great V, it's a six inch, I think it's a 188 or a 250 wall, and it came from Shanghai, it didn't come from anywhere close. But the simple fact is it's a stencil that has an API stencil on it as well, so you know you're getting good product, you know you're getting good uh, first hand, first run material. And then again, developing or coming to the conclusion of what type of material is optimal. Whether you're looking at a low carbon steel or some of these steels that have been uh, included a little bit of copper that's utilized in some of the southwest areas, or the 304 or the 316 stainless. If some of you aren't familiar with the 304 and 316 are basically the same base metal, the simple fact that there's a little bit more nickel and molly leatherman in the 316. That's a great insurance policy if you're looking for extended corrosion from the simple standpoint that you will in fact get a longer life in most applications with 316. 
However, it comes with a heck of a sticker shock from the standpoint it's about 25% more expensive. And then you've got hybrid wells. Hybrid wells would be a PVC casing with a stainless steel or, or slotted wire wrap screen uh, application. Uh, PVC, I'm just going to touch on it. It's typically not utilized in any oil and gas type completion, but it is obviously a mainstay of a great deal of the work that's done in our industry. Corrosion resistant, built to a schedule. It's a very lightweight material. It's got what I would consider some strength limitations from the standpoint that the deeper you get, the heavier the wall. The heavier the wall that you're looking at, typically the more difficult you're going to have producing through that interval if it's slotted. And in high temperature applications, we've recently discovered that CPVC will in fact give us a consideration of some protection in um, high temperature environments where we're having to do neat cement uh, runs up to the surface. If we start looking at the CPVC, it can actually handle temperatures upwards of 200 degrees, which is a far cry from the 140 degrees that you can safely set PVC with. So um, I put this in here from the standpoint of redevelopment challenge. I quite often will get a call from an operator who's got two inch monitoring or four inch remediation wells and they want to go back and rehab these wells. Well, if it's slotted PVC and it's 50% or 50% plug, which is a pretty safe assumption most times or not, they argue, what can I do? And I argue that typically a trichome bit to drill that, drill that well out is going to be one of your more um, what one of your more revol uh, resolving uh, applications. It's just a very difficult material to get rough with. You tend to go ahead and do a great deal of damage to PVC. So sometimes a trichome bit is in fact your uh, best option. Now something else I really want to emphasize is that there's a whole range of diameters and materials that are utilized in the oil and gas industry that we don't even see in our water oil market. From a um, five and a half inch, and I'm trying to see here, seven inch, nine and five eighths, 11 and three quarter, 13 and three, 16, 18, 20, and 26 inch. These are standard stock materials by any oil and gas or oil field tubular um, supplier or wholesaler. A lot of folks never recognize that if they're in a buying from the standpoint that they've got a 16 inch, a 16 inch well and they want to reline it, 13 and 3 eighths may very well be very viable from the standpoint of what they can offer or look at 11 and 3 quarters. Again, screens can be generated in any of these diameters, but these are standard industry available materials from the oil and gas industry. And if you just check with your local suppliers, you may find that, oh yeah, we've got that in stock. I know that in Southern California, many of the distributors handle both <coughs> oil and gas tubulars, or oil field tubulars as they call them, as well as their standard um, nominal diameters that are utilized in the water oil industry. So we're looking at opportunities here where in fact we can look over the fence and take a look at some of the other options that are available to us. I think I mentioned earlier about the stainless steels. Well, here's two that we need to discuss from the standpoint of just the simple metallurgy or the makeup. These are the two general specifications in which uh, stainless steel is made up. AS, uh, ASTM A778 is a non-annealed seam, or ASTM A312 is an annealed seam. What we're talking about here and in here are seams where the two materials are welded together, but there's a heat affected zone. And that heat affected zone, unless you go back and anneal that zone, you have a rapidly or a radically different metallurgy, two unique metals in one particular piece of pipe. So the A312 allows for a post treatment of the weld seam and you get that annealing. And by so doing such, you get a much better overall, well, you get a more uniform piece of uh, pipe across the board. So cost differences, are negligible. I don't think there is, in fact, even a significant cost difference between one or the other. But it's just that you get a unique uh, change in the metallurgy when you may manufacture and not anneal those seams. Now, here's something that might be worth the price of admission. How many of you are aware that API and ASTM allow for a 12.5% wall thickness variation on any steel casing product that's on the market today? It goes back to the 40s and 50s when manufacturing techniques were so primitive, if you will, that they could not control the wall thicknesses of a given piece of pipe. So they petitioned and got from API, ASTM followed right in suit and allowed that same variation. So what we've got is the ASTM and the API specs both allow for the, histor the historical manufacturing constraints of 12.5% wall variance. This 12.5% wall variance is what I just talked about earlier. Don't believe everything you read. Just because it's in this brochure and it basically states that you do in fact have the luxury of having 300 PSI on a given 16 inch 375 wall, you gotta take in consideration that that does in fact take in 
There isn't a single domestic manufacturer, and I don't know of any foreign manufacturers that don't take this into consideration. You will pay for the full wall. You will pay for the full weight of that pipe, but you will be given a greatly diminished anywhere between 10 and 12 and a half percent. And I get a call probably once a year from a contractor who's got a collapse, whether it be a surface or a liner that's collapsed on him, and he's trying to figure out where exactly or what exactly happened. And we'll go back and calculate through. And I'm so far in the last couple of years, I've been within 10 feet of exactly calculating from that 12.5% wall thickness variance. 